Hello, it's Ranger Russ here at Hammonasset Beach State Park. I'm not at the Nature Center today. You can hear the road traffic because I'm out by Route 1. Today's program is going to be coming to you from our own Shoreline Greenway Trail. So I think there's over two miles of trail here. We're only going to walk half of it. I figure I'll do the other half in another walk because they're very different walks. Um, but I really wanted to take you along. I'm going to flip the camera around so that you can see. So we're starting about the halfway point on this trail. And if you look over there, you can see our salt marsh. You can see there's lots of Phragmites between me and the marsh. Phragmites, again, likes to grow in areas where more, there's more fresh water than salt water. So along the edges here, where you get some runoff from the road, that's when you're going to see uh, a lot more Phragmites. Also, if you take a look here, we'll probably see more of this. Many of you are probably familiar with this. It's the beginning of ragweed. And this is the thing that causes so many re aller allergic reactions. So many people are allergic to it. Um, later in the year, it'll get larger. It has green flowers that bloom at the same time as goldenrod. And I'll probably talk about this another time as well. Um, but because people don't see the flowers, they think that everyone believes they're allergic to goldenrod. Where much more commonly, it's ragweed that you have a reaction to. Goldenrod is not a strong one for allergies. And if you take a look, many of these have little spittle bugs. So in here is a little bug. It produces this little bubbly coat to protect it and hangs out inside of the plant or inside the bubbles. I don't want to pull them out. Well, let's see if we can find one of them here. There he is. You see that? That little yellow right there. That's the little spittle bug hanging out inside there. Actually, that looks like the larvae of the spittle bug. So there are lots of them. Lots of the ragweed have those spittle bugs hanging out in there. So if you have any questions, I uh, pop them up at any time. I'll see if I can answer them as we go. And also, if you put up the town that you're from, I like to see how far our program's reaching. Now, earlier there was a chipmunk going in and out of these rocks here. Now he's hiding, he or she. Now take a look at that. If that's not the most beautiful view, I know we're right by the road, but if you look the opposite direction of the road, you see some great views. Now there's a small marsh on the other side of the road, but fresh water pours into that marsh and on this side, which is what gives these Phragmites a foothold here in a salt marsh. There are some fish swimming around in the stream there, some killifish. I don't know if you can see them. Let's move down the trail. Here's a beautiful red cedar tree. I did a whole program on the red cedar. So if you want to go to the virtual learning center, you can see our red cedar tree program. This has got an interesting twist to it. it. Looks like it just continues to twist as it goes up. That is not typical of the red cedar. Uh, if you look there, all of those thin twisty trees, those are sassafras. Sass sassafras was the original uh, flavor for root beer. And then they switched over to the birch. And now sassafras is the flavor for sarsaparilla. If you can find sarsaparilla, naturally flavored sarsaparilla anyway. So here we've got a bit of a wetland. It looks like it could be a, ver a uh, vernal pool, but I believe that there, yeah, it looks like a little bit of a connection over there. So the salt probably comes in here and flushes it out now and then which would make it not very good for amphibians that like to use vernal pools. If you had a, a nice high tide that got salt in here, they wouldn't like that very much. They wouldn't be able to survive it. 
All right, this trail goes, like I mentioned, it's about two miles. The other section on the other side is, has woods on one side and the marsh on the other. This section that we're gonna be walking has the uh, Meg's Point campground on, will be on our right, and then a little patch of woods and Route 1 on the left. But what I really want to talk to you here is how a developed area uh, with a road and that's mowed for camping still is a great place for wildlife. This, this small buffer zone between the campground and the road acts as a place for wildlife. Look, there's a little, looks like a chipping sparrow. Can't tell from here. My eyes are not that good. Ooh, rusty red cap. I'm gonna have to look that one up. All right, staying right there. So that, that's foraging behavior. That bird is foraging for food. We've got some beautiful um, white pine as we go along here. So this is some nice white pine. Next to it is an invasive species. That's a, a Norway maple with poison ivy. We're gonna see how many different kinds of poison ivy or different varieties. It's all the same poison ivy, but different ways that they grow. So here it's growing up the tree like a vine. We'll talk more about poison ivy. Here's another invasive. So one of the problems with roadsides and developed areas is you do get a lot of invasive species. Many of these were planted intentionally because they were beautiful, made a nice ornamental shrub around for decoration. This is a wineberry here. I've actually, I take it back. Uh, no, I think that is wineberry. Okay. Wineberry produces a, a, looks like a red raspberry, really sweet, very delicious, but again, invasive. They grow everywhere. Here's another Norway maple. One of the ways you can tell the Norways from other maples is the bark. The Norway maple is tight. Um, it's kind of like our ash. It's nice, tight little grooves. The sugar maple uh, gets flat patches and flaky patches. And the leaf, well, I have a leaf in my hand. Um, the leaf is broader on the Norway maple. So you get a really big, wide leaf. And I did hear one time that when you break the stem, the uh, Norway maple produces, has a little white uh, cream that comes out and the sugar maple, it's clear or, or nothing comes out at all. So Norway maples would not be good trees to have here. Eventually they could, uh, outcompete all of the sugar and red maples and we might end up not having the amazing maple syrup that we get here in New England. Look at the look at this giant white pine. White pines are fast growing and drop off lots of needles, lots of sap and twigs and branches tend to break off as well. They get freeze and thaw and get brittle in the winter. So not the best uh, tree to have over something that you want to protect and preserve. Ah, look at this one right here. Okay, so this kind of looks like a birch, looks like a black birch, but this is actually a choke cherry. It's a, a wild cherry that grows in the area. And if you strip a little bit of the bark, the cherry smells, uh, I don't know, kind of like dog poop, I guess. It smells really bad. And if you scrape the birch, it will smell like root beer. It smells really good. So that's a way you can tell when they're young. There's one in the back there, and you can see that's got very shaggy bark, very rough bark. The black birch, when it gets bigger, the bark stays nice and smooth. All right. So this looks like a sugar maple here. You can see some rough bark and then some smooth bark. Very different from the Norway maple that we looked at. Here's another nice big white pine. White pines were planted in a lot of state parks. So here's something, this is an ornamental. 
This is a yew. And usually these are growing uh, near uh, structures. People put them in their gardens or edges. They make nice hedges and hedgerows out of them. Uh, not a native. I don't know if it's listed. I don't believe it's listed as an invasive, uh, but it is a uh, not native to this area. Now, this gets a little tricky if you look up here. This is Oriental Bittersweet. Looks like it's growing up another cherry. But if you look at this, it, you get confused because you've got these nice leaves that do not look like the other leaves. There they are side by side. So you really have to pay attention when you look at a tree. Make sure that uh, it's not two trees going to, growing together or a vine growing through the tree if you're trying to identify it with the, uh, with the leaves. Here we've got another invasive. This is uh, honeysuckle, Asian honeysuckle. Does produce a nice little flower. Here's something I haven't seen much of. So the cherry gets, uh, there's a few blights that grow on cherry. They get this cancerous growth on them. Um, they get a, a slimy fungus on them. Lots of things that they can get, but I've never seen it bright red like that before. Here's the Shoreline Greenway Trail uh, marker. I'll see if I can find one that isn't grown into the tree. But again, that's, a, that's another Norway maple. And if you look, it's got that strange twist there. So this would be considered a very unhealthy tree. Um, as that twist gets larger, eventually it's going to get too heavy and we'll have to cut that down. Or the Greenway Trail. So the Greenway Trail Committee, if you look down this trail, absolutely gorgeous. They do a lot of work out here on this trail, uh, putting it in and then maintaining it. They still come out here regularly and pick up the trash, make sure that everything is good and safe. So eventually I'm sure they'll have to trim that limb off. Um, but we have to give a big thank you to the volunteers for the Shoreline Greenway Trail that come out here. I know Perry comes out here a lot. I don't know if he's watching today. Um, but he and a, and a core group of volunteers spend a lot of time maintaining these trails. Uh, through, through the edge of Hammond Acid. It, it's still part of the park, but it goes along the edge of the park in this area. All right, show you a little view of our campground. It's really neat. Don't know when the campground will open for sure. Um, you're gonna have to check Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's website. Look up camping and see if you can uh, find out if they have a solid date yet. Oh, there goes a robin. Now we were talking about uh, the Greenway Trail Committee. They also raised all the money to put this trail in. So it wasn't an inexpensive project getting this money in. Do I still have those birds that would land on the mirrors? A few years ago, I think it was in the campground, there were birds that were landing on people's mirrors. Birds sometimes get attracted by their own reflection. And it, during breeding season, the males get very territorial and they see their reflection in the mirror and they will land on the mirrors or just a windshield or the side of a window and try and get in. So we're not going to have those right now because the campground's not open. There's not a lot of cars over there. I just want to mention something right here before I go completely past it. This is a really nice buffer between the road and the, uh, and the, the trail. And someone has decided this would make a good place for biking. Please do not do this. Please respect the trail and stay on the trail. You can access the trail just a quarter of a mile ahead. There's an access point. So I'm going to ask people to please stay on the trail. Don't create these little side paths. Uh, it's really not good for the trail. Here's a poison ivy growing as a creeper along the ground. So we saw it climbing a tree. And here we see it on the ground. Now take a look. Some of these leaves are very shiny and some of them are getting a little dull. 
So the shininess only stays in the beginning. Now the shiny means that Ushreel oil is right on the surface, um, but it doesn't mean that when they're not shiny that you won't get it. You can still get uh, poison ivy from it. Cardinals that peck at the mirror. Cardinals do it. Other birds do it as well. I know in, uh, I believe it was Indiana, they thought they had vandals breaking the windshields and it turned out it was a woodpecker that was uh, attacking his own reflection and breaking mirrors. So there are a few different birds that will do it. Hopefully we don't have a woodpecker doing it. They've got a more powerful uh, head for breaking glass. There's a cat bird just went through the fence. Cat birds are, are dark gray with a darker gray cap and a rusty red rump. Right under the tail it'll be a rusty red color. Here's more Asian honeysuckle. It was pretty neat when they were choosing the path for the trail. I got to walk out here repeatedly trying to find the best way for this path to go. Uh, they tried to avoid the largest trees and sort of wend their way around and through so that they would preserve the habitat instead of changing it for the trail, which I was really grateful for how uh, thoughtful they were in putting in this trail. If anyone has any questions, you can post them at any time. And also, please put up where you're from. I'm going to encourage you to like us or follow us on Facebook, like our, our YouTube channel as well, visit our website. We have additional information being added to the website and our virtual learning center all the time. We're getting a little windy here. We've got 25 mile an hour winds here today at Hammonasset. Uh, as you get by the shore, it's, it's actually chilly down here right now. I'm not sure anybody inland. I think it's going to be a bit warmer. So we're coming up on marsh on this side. Okay, that's the entrance to the park over there. And there's the wooded area over on this side. More white pines. Now we're into an area with some nice white oaks. So the white oaks, the oaks and the maples are what's considered a climax forest in Connecticut. So the pines will grow first, some softer wood trees, and eventually the oaks will, oaks and maples will take over, and that will be the climax. There's not much more to go beyond that. But nature has a great way of resetting itself, and either a storm will knock it down, a fire might take sections out, a beaver might build a dam and take out a whole bunch of trees, and then you create a field and a, an ability uh, to transition again to the climax. So that's actually really good. Here's a, one of my favorites. This is a high bush blueberry. You almost never get blueberries off of these because the birds get to them first. I feel like I'm always competing with birds for these uh, gorgeous blueberries. But look at how that's another high bush blueberry in the back there. Some big, gorgeous high bush blueberries out here. Here's some more. There's a little sassafras. Now, I'm going to show you a little trick. You see, you've got some maples with the smooth gray bark and this rougher bark here is the sassafras. But take a look right here. This branch, it's completely broken off. It's being held up by green briar. So this is a thorny briar, but it keeps on rubbing against the tree. And it's been doing this for a long time because you can see the wood is a different color from that rubbing. I think this is so neat when you find something like this and it's just constantly rubbing on the tree. So pretty neat. There's another oak in the back there. Lots of oaks in here. So like I said, this is more of a transi transitional zone. 
Oh, we're coming up. Take a look at that oak ahead of us. I've got some people coming up, so I'm going to try not to show them on camera in case they don't want to. But we reached the birch. I remember I wanted to talk to you about a birch. This is a big, beautiful black birch tree. All right. That not very many birches get to be this size. Um, but this is the, the flavor that is used for root beer and birch beer. Uh, I don't believe that they use the root for uh, birch beer. I think it's the cambium layer, which I can't really reach. But just under the bark, of especially the thin uh, stems, you'll get a layer that just smells. Actually, I used to peel it off and eat it as a kid because it tasted like root beer. Down there, look at that. Looks like a hickory tree right there. Beautiful mocker nut hickory. Hickory will grow in uh, before the oaks and the maples, but usually the oaks and the maples will take over and you won't have as many hickories after a time. Ash used to be in there with the, uh, with the hickory, but unfortunately the emerald ash borer is doing a lot of damage to the hickories and uh, I mean the ash and we're not seeing them. Now we're seeing uh, a lot fewer ash trees. Look at this beautiful white oak. I've talked about white oak in a few. It used to be called the stave oak or stav oak because uh, the staves of a barrel, the, the slots that make up the sides of a barrel uh, were made from the oak. Look at this. This is an example of a compound leaf. So this is another hickory. These seven leaflets are part of one compound leaf. So that whole thing that I'm wiggling with my thumb is considered the leaf. And it's a compound leaf. So that's pretty cool. Now, if you look at this oak, this is not a white oak. This is, uh, looks like a black oak. Uh, could be a red. I get those confused a lot. This big chunk of the oak broke off at one point. Now this oak, it looks like that broke off even earlier than this snapped off. You can see there's a bittersweet growing right out of there. That becomes a place where it can trap some debris and then the bittersweet can grow. It becomes a point where the tree will eventually rot into. Here's the piece that broke off. You can see it's been on the ground a long time. All the bark is stripped off of it. And if we look, yeah, I thought we might be able to tell why it came off, but looking how this tree's growing, this tree's not growing in the most healthy shape. You really want a tree to be shaped like this. It's nice and long with branches coming off gradually. Uh, not at a steep angle and not straight up because that becomes points that it can snap off. If it's straight out on a 90 degree, then it gets too much weight and it will snap. Or if it's too straight up, uh, it'll become a sheer point and just split down the tree. And look, there's a little hole there. I wonder what's in there. Wow. That goes way back in there. I can't even, I can't even reach all the way in there. So that's really cool. I wonder if you guys can see what's in there. Should have a flashlight. All right. So again, when you get a tree growing, if we look on this side of it, look at how that branch is growing out of the back of that tree. That is eventually going to break off. There's going to just be too much weight. A tree is not built to grow horizontally. All right. So not the best form for this tree. That's not a very healthy tree and it will eventually snap off. Let's keep going and see what else we can find. I haven't even reached one of the coolest parts of this trail. Now we do keep the, uh, the fence here is to keep people out of the campground. So I'm going to ask people not to try and climb over the fence. Let's see. This is just, look at this. Isn't that the coolest thing? This massive boardwalk that goes up over the salt marsh. 
This is one of the things that made this trail so expensive, but also a very cool aspect of the trail. Oh, look how big these ferns are. Now, if you remember, I showed uh, some ferns in other episodes. They were little fiddleheads at the time. I should have talked more about the fiddleheads because they're yummy. Um, but here we've got some nice big ferns getting ready to go. Oh, look, there's all right up in the back there. They don't like the salt water, so that means the tides don't come up that high very often. Now look at this deck. It's built wide enough for two bicycles to pass each other without much of an issue. This is a handicap accessible trail. Just absolutely beautiful. Let's see if we have any questions. If anybody has any questions, keep them coming. I'll see if I can answer them. Hopefully the wind won't uh, wipe out my mic too much. Again, 25 mile an hour winds down here today. So as I move out from the trees, we're gonna get some more of that. All right, look at this salt marsh. This is part of the salt marsh here at Hammonasset. Absolutely beautiful. The salt marsh is just starting to green out. You can see a lot of green in there. You can see the old, the brown, that's the grasses from last year. I'm going to do an entire program on a salt marsh, so look for that one coming up. Um, I want to wait. I'm trying to put it as late as I can so that the we have as much green in the marsh when we do that program. Uh, now, what is this tree? I think this is a cottonwood. I'm gonna have to ask Bob, my tree guy, to give me an idea on this tree. But I think it's a cottonwood. It's got some very pale leaves there. So we're now walking along the entrance road to Hammond Asset. Lots of cars coming in here today. Again, it's a beautiful day. A little bit of a cool breeze, but I'll take it. You can be outside in the sunlight, enjoying the sunshine. So we're coming up on the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about. I don't know if anybody can see it, but there is a great blue heron right there. I'm going to show you that before. This is a teachable moment. I don't know if you guys can see. It looks kind of like a stump between all the trees over there. So it's behind all those dead trees. It's not moving right now, so it's really hard to tell. But that is pretty darn cool. Just walk right up. And there's a great blue heron. All right, let's keep going. The great blues actually will, will, some of them will be here all year long. Some of them fly away. Now, good thing we looked at that great blue over there because now all I can see is his head sticking up. If we look here, so let's see if you can, oh, there's an osprey flying overhead. Looks like it has a fish too, very cool. All right, so we've got a natural channel coming in through the marsh. This is how the water comes in and out. And you get salt water, so it keeps it a salt marsh. But if you look over here, you sort of see a U of dead trees, okay? That used to be an upland area. This was not part of the salt marsh. As sea level rises, the salt marsh encroaches in the salt water kills these cedar trees. You can see there's one lying down, a couple of dead ones. Looks like there's a, a trunk of another one. Can't tell what type that is. Probably some type of hardwood. But the salt marsh encroaches up and eventually as the salt comes in, these trees are gonna die. They can't survive. But naturally a salt marsh is going to move. As the sea level rises, salt marshes get thicker every year, not a lot, but they do get a little thicker and they can migrate upland. If the sea level is going down, they're gonna migrate down and further away. And, and then the upland area will encroach into the salt marsh. Unfortunately, right now, what we're seeing a lot of with 
climate change as fast as it is, sea levels rising too fast, we have developed too much on the shoreline. You can see we've got the trails and roads are right up against the salt marsh. This doesn't give any place for the salt marsh to migrate upland. And it causes us some real problems because eventually sea level is going to overtop the marsh and it won't be a marsh anymore. A marsh has to have tides go in and out. If the low tide is still covering the marsh, it's not going to be a salt marsh any longer. So uh, it's very concerning. Not sure what we can do about it, but well, I do know some things we can do. Reducing fossil fuels is a big one. I don't know if anybody's been paying attention, but with this pandemic, uh, air quality has improved drastically over just a very short amount of time, faster than people estimated. So that's really cool. All right. Someone's asking about the oaks, why the branches have, why they have branches growing close to the ground and out. So I did mention in a, another program that when they are growing in full sun all the time, they branch out starting right from the ground. If they're growing amongst other trees, they need to grow up and then branch out to reach the sun. So that tree that had the really low, weird branch coming out probably was growing in full sun. It was one of the only trees when it was growing. Um, but that doesn't explain why the trunk was, you know, such an angle like that. It looks like it probably was injured or broken off at some point, And that's what caused it to grow in the shape that it is. All right, I'm going to see if we have any other questions. I think I went a little long today. Um, but I hope everyone is enjoying these programs. I'm going to leave you looking at the uh, great blue heron over there. It's not blue at all. It's very gray. But... Sometimes in the year, some parts of the year, they're going to be much grayer. Other times, they're going to actually be that big, beautiful, beautiful color. Is it an easy walk for a toddler? This Actually, there was just a toddler on the trail ahead of me. It's a bit of a long walk. I don't think you'd want to do the entire trail. But let's show you the trail again. It's nice, hard packed, nice and wide. Uh, I think it'd be a great walk for a toddler. And then you can bring, you can bring a, a carriage along, and if they get tired, then you can push them the rest of the way. So, all right. I hope everybody enjoyed this tour of our Shoreline Greenway Trail here at Hammonasset. There's some nice benches over there. You can stop and rest and view the marsh if you'd like. Uh, I'd like to just sit there the rest of the afternoon and see what other animals pop up out here. I have seen little blue heron. Oh, there goes an egret up that channel. He just fluttered and gave himself away. Can't tell what kind. I'm going to need binoculars. My eyes aren't good enough to tell from here. That's really cool. All right, I want to thank everybody. Hope you enjoyed this program. Tune in tomorrow at 11 o'clock. We'll be doing another uh, animal program. And then tomorrow at 2 o'clock, I will be doing a program on food webs. And also next, this coming Friday at the, two, oh, the 11 o'clock program, I'm going to do a program on blue jays. I have a pair of, a couple of blue jays in the nature center. They're not a breeding pair. I think they're both girls. But we're going to talk about them. We're going to go right in their cage and learn about Blue Jays. So hope everyone is enjoying these programs and I will see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock.